Hello, Cleaning Nation. Welcome to the show. It's time to have some fun. Get ready to soak up some wisdom and find everything you need to grow the cleaning company that you deserve. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Before we get started, I've just been wanting to make sure I'm grateful to Cleaning Nation for supporting the show, sharing the show. We've been getting so many new listeners, so much interest. We've been able to change lots of people's lives. It's all because of you, Cleaning Nation. Keep up the great work. Keep sharing the show. We love you. We appreciate you. You guys and gals are amazing. That said, today we are chatting with Wes Baker from Mid Valley Industrial. Mid Valley serves the Hortonville, Wisconsin area with specialty heavy industrial cleaning services. If you want to reach out to Wes and his team, you get a hold of them at www.midvalleyindustrial.com. Welcome to the show, Wes Baker. Hey, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, glad to have you, man. And we were talking a little bit off air about uh, what you do, and it was so fascinating. I'm going to ask the same question that you already gave me and take a quick break while you share it with Clean Nation because I was digging your story of what you do. So take it away and just give us a little bit of idea of where you started, who you serve, and where you're at now. Okay, well, uh, as, as you said, we're Mid Valley Industrial Services out of Hortonville, Wisconsin. We service uh, really all the upper Midwest, but uh, we specialize more in heavy industrial cleaning, um, which is hydroblasting, vac trucks. Uh, we work with explosive uh, materials sometimes that we vacuum. Um, so we handle a lot more of the heavier more complicated cleaning jobs, but we also do lighter industrial cleaning warehouses, pallet rackings. We service uh, every industry that I know of in the area from foundries to food grade to power plants um, to production facilities. Uh, it's uh, pretty unique and we're very diverse and we offer everything from, like I said, hydroblasting, we do normal pressure washing, um, all the way up to 40,000 PSI, which we do a lot of surface prep or really heavy cleaning. Uh, vacuuming, we do everything from shop vacs up to a vacuum truck, which I like to say is a shop vac on steroids uh, because it's a vacuum cleaner that's ran off a diesel truck, off a semi truck. Um, we do dry foam cleaning, ice blasting. Uh, dry ice blasting, which is a great, unique service. So how did you uh, get, how did you wander into this very, very unique kind of part of the cleaning world? Wow. Well, uh, we've been in business for about 38 years. Uh, we originally started actually as a fab shop uh, doing a lot of coatings. And uh, years ago, uh, the original owner, um, he's had the foresight to see that there was a niche in this and there was a lot of new equipment coming out back then. I mean, in the old days, they used to bucket and rope, you know, this stuff out of tanks and pits. And then they came up with a back truck, uh, you know, which like I said is a back shop vac on steroids. And uh, it's, you know, and it took off from there. And now we actually don't do anything with fabrication. We strictly do all industrial cleaning. And we've been doing that now for about 20 years. Man, that is so cool that uh, you guys just had the foresight to kind of understand the market. And honestly, nothing wrong with fabrication, but that can be a very commoditized business. The cleaning business can be a very commoditized business. But from what you've described about your little slice of heaven, not commoditized. Correct, Mike. Yeah, which is fantastic. All right. Well, A, thank you so much for sharing that story. B, Cleaning Nation, um, back on my my little soapbox for two seconds niche 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 everybody always talks about how do i get away from all the competitors and this and that pick a niche it doesn't have to be industrial but i just love that it's different he needs different equipment he needs different training uh when he goes on a job i bet you there aren't that many job walks it's mostly just kind of consulting and giving bids and it's him and maybe zero to two other uh bidders as opposed to these job walks with a dozen people so i just i love what you're doing um glad to have you on the show hope i can help what's going on in your world today that i can give you some help and support with well, Mike, uh, you know what I think, and I think a lot of other people will have the same uh, consensus is, you know, it's retaining quality employees without just, you know, throwing a pay raise at them. I mean, yes, we know the, the almighty dollar is pretty powerful, but, you know, we all know we've got to also watch our bottom line and our overhead. And so really, you know, I'm looking for some better ideas to use for retaining a quality employee without just throwing more money at them because we all know that's yeah, nice to have, but it doesn't always make you happy. I'm going to make 
a big, potentially ridiculous claim right at the beginning before we lose anybody. We have obviously done shows before, multiple shows on this topic, and I believe I've got, I don't want to say an angle, but a perspective that I haven't shared before. So hopefully this will bring some value to Wes and obviously the rest of you cleaning nation. Um, first of all, I want to tell you, I agree with you probably more than you think on the, how do I fix this problem, comma, without throwing a lot of money at it. Um, that assumption, which so many people have, is money will fix the problem. And you've been in business long enough, Wes, probably. You realize it's not just that I can't afford it, but it won't actually fix the problem because we're never going to... you know, If we've got a cleaner that in, in our market, whatever market you're in, but say cleaners get 12 bucks on, on average per hour. Maybe you pay a 1050, maybe you pay 13 and a half, but you're not going to pay them $62,000 a year. Correct. So, <clears throat> So the thing is, if you do, if you say, well, you know, wages are $12 an hour, I'm going to pay $13.50 or $14, I mean, way over. And obviously scale for what kind of business you're in and what market you're in, maybe some places at 20, maybe sometimes it's minimum wage, just using round numbers here. You throw all that money out of it, two things happen. One, you're shocked and typically angry that, well, these guys aren't any better than the $12 an hour guys. You kind of assume that, you know, generally if you pay for the $2,000 computer is going to be better than the $1,500 computer. And if you pay the $14 an hour guy, it's going to be better than the $12 an hour guy. Uh, not the case. Second, when you use that as a motivation to, to get people, they'll, they'll leave you for the next guy for a nickel, right? So if he wouldn't stay with you for $12, but for $12.52 an hour, fine, I'll stick with you. When someone comes and offers him $12.71 an hour, he's gone. So not only is it expensive, it's not effective. And it, it kind of, motivates bad behavior and people staying for the wrong reason. Any thoughts or, or input on that, Wes, before we move on? No, I, I agree. And uh, that's where, like I said, we've tried a couple of approaches and, you know, given the right people the raise when, when needed or earned. Um, I, I, I mean, I do that, but like I said, it's just there's so much competition for a good employee these days. It's, it's unreal. Yeah, and just a quick caveat so, or disclaimer so no one hears me wrong. I'm not saying you shouldn't pay your people fair wages or use any of these tactics or tools that we're going to give you to, to not pay fair wages because you still have to pay them fair. The, the goal is that's not the focus. So when you say, Wes, hey, when someone does a good job or we obviously give raises, that's fine. Obviously, I'm not saying money's not a motivator, but it's probably number three in terms of why people should or would stay with you. Keep it in its proper place. You don't undervalue it and take advantage of people, but you don't overvalue it and think, I even could throw money at this problem because you can't. All right, that said, here's the biggest trick, and I don't know that I've, I shouldn't say trick, and I don't know that we've covered this, but here's the biggest concept that I've had the most luck with, even in a tight labor economy where it's just the good labor was either they're employed and it just it, there was no one out there. Get them to come to you. It's just like sales and marketing. Uh, instead of trying to get people that are customers, you're trying to get people that are employees, but it's the concepts are exactly the same. It's a very expensive prospect to get a salesperson and a phone book and say, get out there and, uh, or the internet, sorry, I'm a hundred years old. So I'd say phone book, but the <laughs> salesperson, the internet and, 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 and a phone and say, get out there and make some sales. Um, that's, that's an uphill battle and some people can do it, but it's expensive and time consuming and frustrating. The right way is to put a message out that is appealing to your exact right target message or your exact, sorry, a message that's appealing to your exact right target market where they're going to come to you pre-educated, predisposed, pre-qualified to do business with you. So instead of putting a bunch of ads, and I'm not saying you shouldn't run ads, but instead of putting ads out there as your main or only source of, hey, come get here. And when you do do the ad, stop sounding, not you, not US, of course, but everyone else listening, stop sounding like everyone else, generic opportunity for, for improvement. We'll Train, pay, get paid while you train. We pay better than everybody. Free vacation. All the same crap that everybody else says. Don't say that. Share your core value. Share who you really are. So long story short, the big thing that you want to do first is get them to come to you as opposed to go to them. Um, I'm guessing, not just only West, but Clean Nation is going, well, great, idiot. How do I get them to come to me? It's very easy to say. How do I do that? The way you do that is by creating something special. And I'm going to share some specific examples that we did with a company that I had um, that we always had a line of literally people. We had more people wanting, more qualified people wanting to work with us than we had spots to fill. And we were growing fairly quickly. So that was saying something. The way that we did that was we created something special. And I've talked about that before in terms of it's not a commodity. It's not, I give you $10, you give me an hour of your time because there are an infinite amount of options for them to do that deal. And honestly, if you're going to do that deal, you're competing with the government. The government will pay 10 bucks an hour for you to wait in line and you know, pick up your government check every the first of the month. 
So that, right. that's the losing proposition for a business owner, certainly a minimum wage business owner. The way that you create something special is you create a community. I'm going to talk about how we did that at my construction company I had. We would have parties just about every month where we would invite vendors, we'd invite employees, we'd invite employees, spouses, customers. We would do, we'd have, we'd rent a dunk tank and we'd put the, myself included, the executives or kind of the ownership or the, the management in the dunk tape. And then kind of the rank and file would throw balls us as we taunt them. We'd get oversized sumo suits where you bang into each other. We get these huge, ridiculous boxing gloves that were like, you know so oversized you could hit someone as hard as you wanted it was like it was a pillow um and we would have a blast we would invite customers we'd invite friends we'd invite family and you'd be shocked at how when bob the employee who's always been a good employee and likes you and likes them but when he goes home things change and he becomes family bob um how when his wife and kids show up and have a good time and his wife meets uh, John's wife or Susie, who is another employee, and they, they build a connection and the kids make friends, all of a sudden now when Bob gets a nickel more an hour, or he's hung over on a Monday and wants to quit or whatever the case may be, he has a lot more at stake, right? He's not just giving up this crappy $10 an hour job or $15 an hour job he can get somewhere else. He's giving up an entire community that he's never had before in his life. You're providing something that's unique. How those parties work, and that's just one example I've used. I and mean, we would do foosball tournaments at the parties we, with prizes. We'd have awards. Everybody, and we did terrible awards, like best-looking spouse, ugliest car, guy or gal most likely to stink up the bathroom, like worst sale. And we just, <laughs> almost everybody got an award, even if you were a vendor or a customer. We'd give awards for everything. Um, so how that happens is what would happen is, guess what? When you invite friends and family to these things, and we'd have alcohol, and you don't have to do that, but that was, our, that was our, within our core values to, to, to do that. Um, guess what? They invite friends. They invite family. It's a spectacle. Um, people would start saying stuff like, man, how do I get a job at this place? When do you guys hire? I would love my place has never done anything like that. So it's not just having a crappy company, company party that everyone feels obligated to go to. It's creating an event that everybody wants to be a part of. And you know you're doing it right when people go, hey, I, I noticed there was a company party. We didn't get invited because you know, you know, there's, there's buzz created. So that's step one. I'll give you a couple other things, but that, that was a huge thing. Give awards, recognize people, have fun, do parties. Don't be afraid to be ridiculous and let your employees dunk you in cold water when you're taunting them. Questions, comments, or thoughts so far, Wes? Uh, no, I like them. And uh, like I said, we actually have a couple parties a year, um, and they've always been you know, a, a great positive thing um, that people look forward to and, and enjoy. And I'm thinking now maybe I, maybe I just need to do more of them, but more on a smaller scale um, as opposed to our couple larger throughout the year. Yeah, and there's a lot of ways to skin that cat. Um, so I'll tell you how we did it, but certainly there's lots of variations on the scene. And I'm not saying this is the only way to do it. Generally, we'd have we try we'd shoot from monthly. We'd probably miss two or three months a year, so it'd probably be eight or nine regular parties a year. And the only one we kind of went all out and spent a bunch of money and did like a thing was the Christmas party, uh, where we'd right. rent like a go kart place and you know do that or um, a bowling alley or just you know some sort of kind of fun. We did paintball one year. Uh, <laughs> we're in Phoenix, so Christmas you could do that. Uh, yeah. Anyway. So yeah, that's how we did. And I, but the, the thing is consistency. And it's funny because every business owner I talk to um, either has one of two things. Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. I want to try it. And then they try to go, that was fantastic. Or Wes's response, which, oh yeah, we've done that. And I go, how did it go? It went amazing. When's the last time you had one? Seven months ago. They just, we, we forget how important they are. And not one person said, ah, I did it. And I, I never really got a return on my investment. So we quit. And all the hundreds of people I've coached, I've never had that happen. So uh, that's probably something that a lot of you know. I'm just giving you a reminder of, the power that it can be doing or the, the power that it can wield, but you have to be consistent. If you do want, if you're, they're inconsistent, you don't build that. If it's every month, you'll just literally have people coming around to see how you do what you do. How do you do that? Why do you do that? What, how does that work? That's amazing. I remember one time we took our competitors golfing uh, for the crap cup and they, they were welders, fabricators. We were in a different kind of construction. And they built this, I don't know, five foot tall monstrosity out of steel and gears. And it just looked awful. And the loser of the golf had to proudly display that crap cup in their front lobby for everybody to come see. And everybody that walked in, and we lost, of course. Uh, <laughs> I think we did it two or three times. So I, I, we didn't lose every time. But we had that thing in our, in our lobby for a good six months. And every, it started a conversation with everybody. Everybody that walks in would go, what on God's green earth is that? Well, we played golf and we're all awful. It's a bunch of dirty construction workers. So none of us know how to play golf. Um, and, and we tell the story and people start saying things like, I want, how do I get to be a part? They don't never, they don't do stuff like this. So again, we're attracting, we're pre-qualifying. And I, guess what? Some people probably said, 
well, this is stupid. This isn't a professional thing to have in a lobby and you shouldn't have that kind of relationship with your, this seems like a total waste of time and money. Fantastic. I don't want that person applying for my job. They're going to be miserable. So that's a couple, I'll give you one more example of getting them to come to you and then we'll hit the lightning round. Last example is, um, this is uh, a while back before I was married. I had a, I was dating a girl uh, from England who had a beautiful a- accent and I had to record our, our message. So not only if you called and got a message, but she would also record the, you know, press one for this or two for that, or, you know, kind of get you through the directory. And she introduced herself as, Hey, this is your sexy English automated attendant, but you have to picture, I wish I had a recording I could play, uh, but you have to picture coming from a very attractive female voice. And, you know, press one if you want this and press two if you want this. And she talked about our core values and people like that so much. They would literally, we'd pick up the phone and they go, oh, no, no, I got my buddy John here. He wants to hear the sex. Hang up, hang up. We're going to call back. Don't pick up. I want to hear, I want the voicemail. So we'd literally have people want to hang up with our operators so they could play for their friends the voicemail that we had. And again, that creates the same thing. How do I get a job at this place? And you start, I'd start getting invited to write articles or speak, and people would literally come around to see how we did what we did. How do you do this? How do you create this thing? When you start doing that, uh, and again, whether it's the press or friends and family or prospective employees, and it didn't hurt with customers either, everybody wants to be a part of this community because they don't have that in other places in their lives, sadly. And then, of course, being uh, an employee or a customer or a vendor was just gravy on the cake, but they all wanted to be a part. So I would encourage you, and you don't have to do it exactly the way I've just lined out, but stop kind of pushing and trying to pull people into you and just create a space that everybody wants to come be a part of. Thoughts, Wes? No, I, I like that idea. Uh, you know, it's. Uh... I think we, we try to do that, but I think at the same time, you know, as, as a manager, you know what, I'm, I'm getting pulled 10 different directions. And, uh, I mean, one thought I had, I just, I'm like, I have to designate somebody to be the, uh, the morale manager to, you know, to be able to run with this and handle it and, you know, work on improving morale and happiness and creating a family environment like you were talking about. Yeah, and uh, that's really insightful, Wes. I had to go through that and figure out doing it. So now I feel stupid. I talked to you for five minutes. You kind of already saw what took me nine months to figure out. So thanks a lot, jerk. But <laughs> um, but the, the dichotomy is it's really harder than you think and easier than you think. So you're exactly right, Wes, in that it's one of those things if you kind of just think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell somebody and it'll magically happen, you're going to be sorely disappointed because it does take work. It's also one of the things if you do, just like Wes suggested, kind of tap somebody and say, hey, and depending on the size of your company, if you're under 100 people, it wouldn't be a full-time gig. It'd be uh, part of someone else's regular duties and it'd be someone that loves this and is just kind of made for this. But if you if you do a little, it's, it's more work than you think it might be. But once you get the ball rolling, you've kind of got the system in place and you're just used to the flow and rhythm of these parties, it's less work than you might imagine. So... Don't get overwhelmed by the amount of work, but just don't assume it's nothing. If you're willing to put some time and some budget, it really can, after the first couple, start um, uh, start self-propagating. And I won't even get into this, but another thing you can do is lunch and learns, or you don't have to do lunch and learns, or just buy your, your customers lunch, take a bunch of video, have a bunch of fun. That's another way to kind of create that thing where everybody wants an invite, everybody wants to be a part, everybody wants to see how you're doing it. Um, again, I just want to give you a bunch of examples. Most of the time I talk more culture and, and, and core values, which is super important. But today I just wanted to hit Wes and Cleaning Nation with some very specific things that we did that had a, a tremendous result. Any questions or thoughts before we hit the lightning round, Wes? No, Mike, I, I like I like your ideas. All right. Well, we're, I think I'm going to like yours, but I'm going to shut up for two seconds and give you an opportunity to share with Cleaning Nation what you've learned over the last couple of decades in the business. Uh, I'm going to ask you three quick questions. I'm fully confident you're going to give three amazing answers. Question number one, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Uh, you know, it's an oldie but a goodie, and it's take care of those who take care of you. I couldn't have said it better myself, and all I do is talk. Question number two, what's the biggest mistake that you've made in the cleaning business that maybe we can learn from? Ooh, I would have to say uh, probably being a little complacent and not being proactive when, you know, you start to think maybe that's going to be a problem and you go, well, you know, nah, you know, I don't don't think it's going to be. And you just kind of put it to the side and then it comes back uh, two months later and you go, ah, gosh, darn it. Why did I not be more proactive on this a couple months ago? Gosh, get that, I, we've done a couple hundred shows now, and I don't know that I've had that answer before, which is sad because I love it. Well said. Last question. What's one easy to implement, simple, quick, implementable idea that Cleaning Nation can put into practice right away that will somehow improve their lives and or their businesses? 
Um, you know, I can tell you something that I'm always looking for is other uh, industrial cleaners to partner with on projects. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I think I would like to be able to see, you know, if I needed a, a, a lighter industrial cleaner on a project with me to help, if I knew or had some, you know, kind of like, a, I'm not going to promote them, but, you know, like an Angie's List or whatever, where, you know, you could reach out to, you know, even though it's a competitor, but somebody you can partner with that, uh, you know, you can trust to help you on a job. Yeah, strategic alliances are huge. I think Harvey McKay said it best when he said, dig your well before you're thirsty, uh, which if I'm not, I don't want to misquote you, but it sounds like that's what you're saying in terms of start building these relationships now as opposed to waiting until, hey, I've got this job immediately. I need someone tomorrow. Start start doing ridiculous things like golf outings and crap cups with potential strategic alliances before you need them. Is that a fair, am I picking up what you're laying down? Exactly. Beautiful. All right, Wes, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing your story, your niche, your passion for the business. I know that Cleaning Nation appreciates you. I appreciate you. Cleaning Nation, when you want to check out Wes's show notes page and get everything you need to grow your cleaning company, growmycleaningcompany.com. Leave your questions, your comments, your rude remarks. I will see you there. Congratulations. You are now 16% smarter. Still can't get enough cleaning goodness? Go to www.growmycleaningcompany.com for more of the good stuff. Ever want to be rich and famous? Owners of cleaning companies as well as industry experts can apply to be featured on the show by emailing our producer Natalie at support at growmycleaningcompany.com. Until then, don't miss out on all the latest cleaning industry loving at www.growmycleaningcompany.com. Check it out now.